Hello, we are live. Today is uh, the third YouTube Live recap Q&A and discussion of the Chinese concepts in the latest episode of the China Myth Podcast. So you're going to see me looking this way because this is simultaneously being streamed on Facebook Live. So Facebook Live is here and then uh, YouTube Live is here. But we're all going to be uh, talking about the same thing. And if you have uh, any questions, you can post them into the chat. If you hopefully you've listened to the latest episode, uh, the latest the episode is called Yin Yang Guanxi Connections. But I kind of think that this episode talks more about Shanghai life. Uh, well, my Shanghai life and maybe the darker side of Chinese stereotypes. So again, this works in both directions. How do we perceive and stereotype Chinese people? And also really important is how Chinese people perceive and stereotype us. What are some of the sources and causes of the various stereotypes and misperceptions? And if we're aware of them, what can we do to actually uh, gain an advantage because we understand how we might be perceived before people actually know us. And that's important because it really deals with if you are stereotyped a certain way, the other person will have a certain level of expectation. And if you can pleasantly surprise someone based on what their expectations are, then it helps you gain an advantage, especially in developing deeper guanxi relationships. Okay. So this entire episode is really about self-awareness. I mean, we talk about other things, which we'll get into, but it's really about self-awareness. And so I begin the episode off with describing who I am, okay, and how I might be stereotyped or perceived in China based on who I am. So I am an American-born Chinese. Uh, Sometimes we call that uh, a banana, yellow on the outside, but white on the inside. So it means I'm ethnically Chinese, but a lot of my thinking, uh, a lot of my values are probably more Western. And the key is not which values are better. Uh, the key is being aware of the differences. So if I think being direct and honest is important, I should be aware that Chinese people culturally aren't accustomed to that. They speak in a more face-giving, uh, relative, relative manner or, or, or circular manner, whatever you want to call it. It's different. And the importance is not is understanding how they're different and having that level of awareness. So in the story that we talk about uh, in episode three uh, and yin yang, uh, you know, the, the dark and the light, the balance between dark and light, black and white. Um, as we've all heard, you know, China as a culture and as a society, you hear this word all the time, tries to maintain harmony. And in order to maintain harmony, uh, they want to seek a balance between the various forces that are going on, both the light forces and the dark forces or the black and the white forces. And this is a great segue into some of the things that we actually talk about in this episode. So the story itself really uh, shares what my Shanghai life was when I was living and working in Shanghai. You know, I was a China expat. Um, a lot of you listening are probably expats in China, too. So you went to a lot of the same places that I went. And one of the places that Shanghai expats like to go to is they like to go to these bar restaurants where you can you can there's happy hour and you can listen to the house band uh, play, you know, American hard rock music. Um, there's pool tables. You can join pool leagues, which is what this story is really all about. Uh, you know, I hosted a lot of meetup events at a lot of these bars. So um, so I incorporated this aspect of Shanghai life 
into my business when I was in Shanghai. Uh, but I also encountered some things that made me as a Westerner or, or a Caucasian uh, kind of feel ashamed because a lot of the stereotypes that Chinese people have of us as Americans is derived from Westerners behaving poorly in China. And even though I'm uh, an American, um, I encountered Westerners behaving in poorly in China directed directly at me because I'm ethnically Chinese. I look Chinese and you know, my stature may be smaller. You know, I'm only five, nine. So if somebody who's like six foot tall and weighs, you know, 230 pounds, I would be someone that's easy to, in Chinese, we'll call it qi fu, which is to take advantage of because I'm smaller and weaker. So the episode itself is about an encounter that I had with a British guy called Keith, who was very arrogant and felt somehow, and this is a terrible thing if you're in China, uh, felt entitled because he was a foreigner in China. And it's part of this arrogant persona that not just British people, but a lot of foreigners have in China. Now, 10 years ago, if you were an arrogant uh, Caucasian American in China, you could probably get away with it. Today, you cannot. <laughs> you have to be very, very cautious of how you are perceived uh, especially if you're a, a foreigner from America or from, from England, because the entire societal perception of foreigners and the relative hierarchy where 10 or 15 years ago, China was kind of maybe subordinate to America as the dominant superpower. Well, that's all changed, you know. China isn't just a rising power. China has risen. So it's a completely different attitude that you're going to encounter. If you're in China, you're a foreigner and you are arrogant with a sense of entitlement. And this is the story that I wanted to share about this guy named Keith, who I encountered at the Big Bamboo Bar and Restaurant in Pudong District. So the main point of this podcast is stereotypes exist. And we need to be aware not only of how we are stereotyped by others, but also how others may stereotype us. Okay. Now, I wouldn't be perceived as a quote unquote blonde hair, blue eyed Caucasian American because. Well, I don't look that way. And a lot of perceptions and stereotypes are based on looks. But once people find out that I was born and raised, when I said people, once people in China find out that I was born and raised in America and, and they, they understand some of my Western ideas, values, and opinions, then some of those stereotypes will change because everybody knows what an ABC is. So ABCs have a certain stereotype or a certain persona when they are in China. And there's a lot of ABCs because a lot of American born Chinese like me take advantage of being bilingual uh, and find opportunities to do business in China or help multinational companies manage certain projects or businesses or people in China. So there's a lot of us. ABCs, or there were a lot of us ABCs in China, and we're probably perceived a certain way. And the key to really developing that higher and deeper level of Guanxi relationship is to understand that perception and to use it to your advantage. Uh, for example, I speak, the joke is I speak English almost as well as I speak Chinese because I speak Chinese fluently. So I can actually use that to my advantage when I'm 
doing business in China. If somebody knows that I'm an ABC, knows that I'm an American, and then uh, suddenly I'm speaking Chinese as fluently as they speak it, I, I seem to talk about foreigners as they and Chinese as we, woman, common, then suddenly uh, I've gained an advantage to develop greater trust and closer guanxi relationships, okay? So self-awareness is really the key. And again, I see some people coming on the Facebook Live, so I have two cameras going on. If you want to uh, ask a question in the chat, uh, you, can, you have to switch over to YouTube and you can type a question in the chat. This is again, reviewing episode three of the China Myth Podcast. So self-awareness is really, really the key, okay? And so if we continue the story of this arrogant British guy named Keith who wanted to physically fight me, I mean, this was amazing that we could be adults and he asked me to step outside and he told me to keep my mouth shut. He asked me to step outside. He asked me to, you know, grab my money, you know, grab my cue and let's play snooker. I don't even know what he was talking about. There's no snooker tables at the big bamboo. So it was a very, very surreal experience of Westerners behaving poorly in China. Now, fortunately for Keith, he directed it at an American, not at a Chinese person, because if he had directed that to somebody in China, then uh, he may have had to pay a higher price. But that gets into the continuation of the story of my Guanxi connections with Xiao He, who was my personal driver in Shanghai, where uh, I didn't let the situation with Keith escalate. So nothing actually happened. We didn't actually fight uh, and nobody actually got hurt. Uh, but I wanted to also point out that, you know, the way that China works is that a lot of things happen by official means but then the majority of things happen by unofficial means. And whether you're a Chinese or a foreigner in China, one of the things that you eventually realize is that the authorities are not often willing to deal with your complaints, even if you have legitimate complaints. So a lot of times when foreign companies file grievances that for example, somebody is stealing their IP or somebody is doing something, uh, a lot of times there's just, they'll take your complaint and there's an indefinite wait until somebody addresses your issue, which means you might as well not even file the complaint because they're never gonna get to it, okay? Uh, so in China, sometimes the people who understand that there are different categories of problems that you have to solve. One category is ones that you can solve through official means. Another category is things that can only be solved through unofficial means. So you have to have that guanxi connection to solve those through a different way. And then there's this third category that I think a lot of people miss or overlook. There's a third category of issues and problems that you should just forget and ignore because they're not worth the time, energy, and resources to actually address them. You might as well focus on something more positive than trying to resolve something that is negative. And that mindset will help you, will, will work wonders over the long term in China because instead of, uh, actively engaging in enforcement of, of rules and policies that you think your partners, employees, and stakeholders have somehow broken, uh, which is backward looking, you're actually more proactive in changing the incentives for people to behave and respond differently. And ultimately, when you do that, you get much greater collaboration. You get much uh, better uh, and more constructive partnerships or relationships whether you call it guanxi or not it really doesn't matter it just it's a mindset 
that I think is important. And I didn't write about this in the in the episode, but you know, as a as a foreigner doing business in China, you really should think about uh, three categories of issues that you will encounter. One is those that you should address through official channels, those that can only be addressed through unofficial channel channels, and those that you should simply just forget and ignore because they're not worth the time, effort, and energy. And I would say 80% of the things that you're going to encounter fall into that third category. So that's just something to be mindful of. But the interesting thing is, is kind of wanted to give you a deeper perspective of how China really works. I talked about, I had a, another option to deal with Keith, the arrogant Brit who asked me to step outside because he didn't want to play by the Shanghai rules when we were playing eight ball. Uh, my, it was that I could have dealt with this in a very mafia type way. Now, again, for full disclosure, I'm not encouraging anybody to take this route. I'm just saying that sometimes it's a good feeling when you know that you have this as an option. Okay. So, uh, one of the ways, and you hear stories about this all the time. So two restaurants open side by side next to each other, and they're competing for the same customers and they get into a disagreement about something. And you may suddenly, so one restaurant owner may hire a bunch of fake patrons to sit in that other restaurant, occupy all the empty seats, order water and never order food and then just discourage anybody from going in that restaurant. And they can do that for a period of time until eventually that restaurant goes out of business because there's nothing you can do if patrons come in and order water. I don't think they have policies where you have a minimum order to come in or anything like that. So uh, that's an example of what I, you know, again, the Chinese concept is wan hei de, huo wan bai de. That means you, that means if you think of, if you think it, I always say this, you think of it as a game. In order to play the China game inside the Chinese arena, you have to understand the rules and how the game is played. In this analogy, if you can play both the dark pieces and the light pieces, then you should have a tremendous advantage and you should always come out on top because you can play the dark pieces and you can play the light pieces. That is, again, uh, relates directly back to the Chinese concept of yin yang, or as, as Westerners like to pronounce it, yin and yang. That's not the correct pronunciation, but um, it's being able to understand that there are there's a dark side and a light side to everything cultural. And harmony is achieved by finding balance between the light and the dark. And the balance of your business maintaining harmony is being able to deal with issues that you resolve officially and issues that you resolve unofficially if you have those guanxi connections and those issues that you should ignore because addressing them actually creates disharmony. It creates a disruption to different stakeholders and maybe even to the community or the society. And you should just simply uh, ignore those issues. Okay. So I see a couple people on the chat uh, or on the YouTube live stream. So I would love for you to ask a question in the chat or just say hi. Let me know who you are. There's also people on the Facebook live stream. Hi, Judith, if you're interested in asking a question, I don't know you had a chance to listen to uh, episode three of the China Myth podcast, but if you want to switch over to YouTube, you can ask a question and I'll answer it live. You can also just post your question in the comments. I'll get back to it uh, in time. If you've missed any of the episodes, the links are in the description, how to access uh, the China Myth podcast. The next, ish, the next episode launches tomorrow. So we always do these recaps on Tuesday because everybody's had essentially a week to listen to the latest episode, but we really want to add more context uh, and nuance to what was being described so you can really get the 
you can really get a sense of how China works and what adjustments you should make to your attitude, mindset, and approach in order to achieve greater harmony with the community, the society, and all the stakeholders in China. But in the long run, to not uh, not be disappointed because you didn't know how to interpret Chinese behavior because you may be in a what we call the Chinese honeymoon period and people are giving you face and you don't understand how they really think and how they really feel. And when you aren't able to do that or you don't understand, then you are myopic and you proceed down a path that ultimately people will start to, uh, you'll start to encounter resistance. You won't know where it's from. Uh, if you're not giving, we talked about this also, uh, some of the partners that you work with, if you're not reciprocating in a manner that they feel they are entitled to, then, um, then they will extract the goodwill that they are missing from other parts of the value chain. And we call that goodwill extraction. We talk about that a lot, or we will talk about that more in later episodes of the China Myth Podcast. I think maybe the next episode really gets into goodwill extraction, but I have, I'm not sure. Uh, we've already published uh, five episodes. Episode six is ready. I'm currently working on episode seven. Uh, so I kind of keep miss, I kind of forget what's coming up next because it's already in the queue, so to speak. All right. So I want to leave everybody kind of with one experience that I had in 1994. No, I'm sorry. In 2004. Wow. Time really flies in 2004. So this was essentially 17 years ago. 17 years ago was when I had my first business. It's not the first time I've been to China, but it was my first business trip to China. And I had the privilege to sit in the office of David Chang, who was then the China CEO of Philips China. Now, it's not because I was doing business with Philips, it's because David Chang was a close friend of my uncle. And it was almost like my uncle said, okay, my nephew is coming to China. Perhaps you can meet him and give him some advice because he's never been to China. Of course, I've been to China, but I've never done business in China. And so I had this opportunity 17 years ago to sit in the office of one of the CEOs of back then, one of the most successful multinational companies doing business in China. And that was David Chen. And I still remember this to this day. I was sitting in his office. Uh, it was in, you know, downtown Shanghai. It was up. Fabulous office. Uh, and we we're sitting at his conference table and he gave me this quote. He said, Gene, uh, in order to be successful in China, you need to be able to manage the different shades of gray because nothing in China is black or white. And that quote has stuck with me since then. But as I've accumulated more experience, I more understand the context of what he means with that quote. Uh, you know, as a foreigner, we think in absolutes, absolute truth. It's either a fact or it's not. It's either A or it's B. But in China, people don't think in absolute truths. They think in relative truths. So it's not A or B. It's not yes or no. It depends. Everything depends. It's relative to something else. So just with that simple dichotomy between of truth between the western definition of truth which is absolute and the chinese definition of truth which is relative you understand what what david meant by managing different shades of gray because in china it's neither black nor white it's somewhere in between and it depends so it means you have to manage the different shades of gray in the context of the story of yin yang of having official resources and unofficial resources, it means that there isn't always one official way to solve the problems that you have. There are multiple ways. And a lot of times, getting back to some of the Chinese terms we used in the previous episodes, sometimes 
In China, you have to 想办法 which means you can't just hire a lawyer and solve your problem in China. You have to figure out a way that is both constructive and uh, allows you to maintain peaceful coexistence or harmony with all of your stakeholders, all of your community, and the greater society in China at large. And if you're able to do that, you're going to have a much more rewarding experience. And the whole point of this podcast is to help you reimagine China, to develop a healthier attitude, but that begins with a different mindset. The mindset adjustments that you are able to make will enable you to experience China completely different than people who are there who are just always frustrated and complaining about China this and China that. Uh, no, China can be one of the most rewarding experiences you will ever have. But generally speaking, it requires for you to first make a mindset adjustment. All right. So uh, this is the end of the recap Q&A for episode three. I call it Shanghai Life and the dark side of Chinese stereotypes. I hope this was a good supplement to actually listening to the podcast. And again, if you want to read the podcast, there's also a link to Kindle Vela. Each podcast is published as a short story. If you really want to see what are the Chinese characters, what is the phonetic pronunciation, and read more about that, you can actually read each episode on Kindle Vela as a short story. Um, the first three episodes on Kindle Vela are always free. I think uh, it's a new platform for Amazon. So I think you get like 200 free tokens. So uh, check it out. And again, if you have any questions, please post them in the chat. I will always respond to comments, even if they happen later on YouTube and in Facebook and any other way you want to engage with me. It's all good. Uh, thank you for listening live on Facebook. Thank you for being here on YouTube. And looking forward to hearing your questions and comments uh, for this episode and previous episodes and future episodes. All right. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.